We are uh, very fortunate today to have some wonderful speakers who are going to share their thoughts on the field of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. Sometimes a second M for medicine gets added to that too. So then we say STEAM. So, uh, and leading us off today is Dr. Jean Poor, who I have often said personifies the field of STEAM. So uh, what we'll do is he will lead off with about 15 minutes uh, talking about the interlocking and dynamic world of STEAM and um, how in his personal case he has used that to found and create a business um, named Life Formations and uh, Life Formations is an animatronics firm and they have created creatures and things <laughs> for museums, amusement parks, etc., all over the world. And a uh, few of those companies, perhaps you've heard of places like, oh, Disney, Universal Studios, the Lincoln Museum, places like that. Uh, Dr. Poor has also authored eight books, a number of articles, and uh, recently retired from serving as the Scott Hamilton Endowed Professor of Entrepreneurship at Bowling Green. Um, earlier in his life, some of you may have also visited a very cool restaurant that he owned called Parrot and the Peacock. So, Dr. Poor, why don't you get us started, and following his presentation, we will bring up our panelists, and I'll introduce them at that time. So please welcome Dr. Jean Poor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm so excited to be here, I can't stand myself. I, um, I have an apology to make this morning. And uh, it, it, it involves that I'm not going to be able to show you my best work. And I'm not even going to be able to tell you who I do my best work for. They just won't allow it. And it's embarrassing because it's, it's what I want to share with all of you, the kinds of things that I do and, and the, the, the crazy stuff that comes out of a company like Life Formations. Uh, I gave this presentation uh, about six weeks ago, and um, I, after I was done, a couple came up to me and, and kind of pushed me into the corner and said, listen, um, I'm a big fan of, I, I, I know who you do work for, and uh, it, it would just, would you just acknowledge the fact that you do them and maybe tell me one or two names of, of projects that you did for them. And I said, uh, can you keep a secret? And she said, yes. And I said, so can I. <laughs> and uh, she wasn't done with me. Um, she got closer to me and she said, listen, uh, we're going on vacation next week and I'm taking our grandchildren. And it would be so important for me to be able to walk through the park and, and point out different things that you've done. And I, I could say that I actually know the guy that was involved in that. And uh, couldn't you do that for me? And I said, if I told you that, I would have to kill you. <laughs> and she looked at me, and then she looked at her husband, and then she looked back at me again and said, could you tell him? <laughs> And so, uh, one way or the other, she was going to get it out of me, and I couldn't do it. And so, I, I can only show you what we're about. And, uh, and so, uh, these are the kind of characters, these are animated characters that we've done. And I thought this might be a good way of starting out by, by talking about STEM and 
you're probably either saying, are they putting the A in or are they taking the A out? And in this case, they were putting the A in. And um, I think it's, it's really important for you to know that I'm a steamer. I have been one my whole life. Um, I can't explain to you exactly how it happened because we know that STEM came into being about 2000, year 2000, somewhere in there. And then STEAM came about six years later uh, with what took place. Um, but, you know, it's been around forever. It's just now education's trying to get a hold of it and do the magic that they want it to do, and it's capable of doing it. Um, I think this probably is a good example of, of what goes on in your brain. You know, um, it, it, it's, it's the best demonstration, I think, of how people think. Uh, did, you ever, uh, did you ever think about how you think? I, do you have a propensity for it? Some of you are left-brainers, and some of you are right-brainers, and some of you are maybe are no-brainers, uh, or a combination of both of those. But it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it, there's, there's, there's a synergy that happens when you can get the creative side and the logical side put together. That's, that's really what it's about, is, is trying to find, you know, there's, Da Vinci said there's art in science and there's science in art. And, and basically that marriage of those two really form a very unique characteristic of people. Now, in the company that I'm going to share with you, um, I want to, there was, there's, there was a line that, that was on the screen when you walked in, and it said, basically, the future's already here. It just isn't evenly distributed. My company has two different locations. It has one in Bowling Green, and that's the one we started in 1990. And it, it is still doing the same kinds of things that, it's, that, that it was doing in 90 today. It is, nothing's changed. And I'm gonna walk you through that. I, if I took you in a bus and I took you down to Cincinnati, which is a much bigger location with 80 people working there, I would be showing you the future. There are things that when I walk in the building, I'm just amazed at it. And so here's a perfect example of how companies can have things going on within it that, that are both hanging on to the past because this is how they know, and this is how they work, and then the, the companies that are in the future are, are so far out there, it just drives me crazy to even look at it. And so these two guys are really very fond of this, and this, this world of steaming is interesting. I am standing in front of you because I, I am a big fan of having people that are heroes. And these two people are, are some of my, my heroes that brought me along and made a steamer out of me. And if you look at them, they both come from multiple generations. But the important thing about them, as you look at their characteristics, is that they share them. They were both doers. They both gave great press. They both were, I mean, they all had minions. Uh, they had people that were working for them. But they changed my life because people point at me and they say to me, um, poor is really creative. And I giggle because I've never had an original idea in my life. You know, if you, if you go out and you steal an idea from somebody, that's plagiarism, you know, that's theft, that's illegal. But if you steal from lots of people, <laughs> that's research, okay? And so I'm basically a researcher. And it was a long, long time 
that I had a hard time shaving in the morning because I felt guilty of, of having to tell people, I'm really not as creative as you think. You know, I'm really good at doing research. And then Edison had this quote that drives me crazy because he really made me an honest person. He said, make it a practice to look for novel and interesting ideas that other people have used successfully. Your idea has to be original only in its adaptation to what the problem is that you're working on. And that's a powerful comment. I mean, it, it really is. It, it, I can remember delivering that. I've never had an original line idea in my life in front of the president of the university. And he was sitting right there. And when I said that, that, that notion of you know, where you get your ideas, uh, I thought he was going to fall off the chair. And it wasn't Rodney Rogers, as a matter of fact. So we, we should clear that up. Um, with, with this guy, you know, this guy actually played a part in my life as well because, you know, he said, we are here to make a dent in the universe. If we don't, then what's the reason to be here? And then he brings in the notion of, of, of art right away, art and poetry and things of that kind of things that go on in that phenomena. But the one, the one, the one person in my life that really, really took me down a different avenue was Disney. Because, um, you know, he had a line that I just loved. He said, you know, we opened up, we opened up a new door. I have to go back. He always animated things off a drawing board. And, and when he started working with three-dimensional objects and putting those together, that really was a monumental moment for me. Because I got to go to the World's Fair back in 1964, and when he introduced Lincoln, and Lincoln stood up and made a presentation, I looked at that going, that's my future. That's what I want to do. I know how to be a technologist. I know how to be an artist. I know how to put those things together. You just wait. Now, I didn't get there right away. It took a while. Uh, I, I'd made a number of mistakes. I got involved in a lot of other projects. I always said that, that there was a time in my life at Bowling Green that I did more harm to my career than was possible because I just couldn't stop starting businesses. And it was only after probably 25 years of them putting up with me um, that I, I, I finally, somebody said that they were looking for an entrepreneur on campus. And they said, you've got one that you can't control. And that was me. And they said, perfect. So instead of having to dodge bullets, I now got celebrated for doing entrepreneurial work. And this was a company that I knew that I was going to start. I didn't know when, I didn't know how, but I was going to find a way. And by being a steamer, uh, it, it's, it's really very, very interesting. So the company was called Life Formations. And I'll take you through the first company. You know, I had to do my own Lincoln. And so not only would I do Lincoln, I'd do the whole family. So, uh, and then when we got done doing the family, we decided, well, we might as well put him in his workplace in one of the kinds of things that we were doing. And some of our earliest work was really, really admired by the people that were also doing animation out there. Um, you know, this is Edison, again, our Edison. And if you get close to him, you can kind of see the different kinds of, of detail that we're capable of doing. And, uh, and, and that's what our company's known for, two things. The realism that we come about and how wacky we sometimes can be. So we're at both sides of that. And some of the people that we've done, you may or may not recognize them. Again, I'd love to be able to show you some things that we've gotten that, and the, the amount of movements that we have. Uh, early on, well, I'll get to there. But early on, you know, if, if we had seven or eight movements in a character, that was good enough. Now we're looking at characters that have 
40 and 50 moves in them, and they'll have maybe 35 or 40 moves just in their face. So the realism has been improved up and up. So these are some of the kinds of things that we've done in the past. You may recognize some of them, some of you don't. Then we do a lot of things that aren't human looking, and that, you know, these are some of the stuff that we've done that are just crazy. And, and that's what we're really known for, is just being out there and doing some things that, that nobody else does. And that's, what, that's why you bring in the creative elements of it. They're, you know, when you look at the left-brainers and the right-brainers, the left-brainers, they like to work within rules. They like to, to know what are the steps? How do you go about doing it? You know, what are the moves, you know, they, they want to work within the confines of, of how that business or that discipline works. With the right brainers, you know, they really don't think in terms of rules. They're always pushing, you know, always crossing over. Why do we have to do it that way? Why can't we do things differently? And so, you know, we always try to demonstrate that. These are pieces that we took to trade shows. That's how we would sell. There's a trade show for, for theme parks, there's a trade show for restaurants, there's a trade show for museums, and we attend all of them showing our work, and it's appreciated. This is a piece, to show you how crazy things can be, this was a piece that we originally did to, to make a machine that was a fortune teller. But instead of it being just the typical fortune teller that you would see in a carnival or something like that, this one had a New York attitude. So when you'd put a dollar into it, he'd just start crapping on you. He'd just go, where'd you park your DeLorean? Where'd you get those clothes? What do you kind of, what, what, have you, what do you expect me to tell you for a dollar? And the first one we put out was bought by uh, Hollywood Boulevard in, 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 in LA. And uh, the guy calls me and says, it, it's not working. We just put it in two days ago and it stopped working. I said, well, check this, check that, check this. And all of it was fine. And I said, open up the money box. And it was full. Within three days, it had taken in $500. So these things, so uh, I, I had a phone call when I was at the airport once and it was David Copperfield. He had seen it at another place, and he wanted one. So we made one for his island. I always thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I got to deliver this to his <laughs> island? Never happened. Um, but he has one. And now what I find recently is that there were only 17 made, and I made them all. You know? And now I find out they're collectible. And I have a guy that owns three of them, and he wants to own them all. Uh, just because he knows that, that he can use them for trade and things of that sort. So when, you, when we start in the Bowling Green operation, we start typically with a photograph. And Laura, this is Laura Melton. She's been with us for 35 years. And she's, you know, I've been blessed by having multiple world-class sculptors, and she is. And, and she's incredible. She works on that and, and that and, and ends up with something like this. Um, as you know, Scott Lavender is uh, Johnny Mathis's conductor and lives in Finley. I'm a big Johnny Mathis fan. I've had Johnny Mathis in my basement for 15 years. And, uh, and, and so Scott goes, well, you need to do an older one. So I had Laura sculpt one. And I want to show you how Laura works. Here's her sculpt, and then she slides it back over and shows you that's Sean. And what happens is we've got a camera on her sculpt, and we have a camera on his picture. And so she can just move that back and forth and then get that particular, that exactness that we can do. it. And she can do it with the sides as well. So that's how she works. But that's old technology. That's Bowling Green. That's the way Bowling Green thinks. And we've been doing it, and it works for us. And then here's Fred Rogers, again, working from it. This is what Fred looked like um, when, when she got the sculpt done. And then this is what Fred looked like. Well, first of all, we had to make a mold of it. And then we had to make 
uh, uh, basically we had to make a core so that we can do it. Uh, and then basically uh, from that, then we went into uh, the, the, the whole process of, of uh, making the body parts. And there's Fred. And, uh, and then we did all the, you know, we can do all the, the skin that goes along with it, as well as the costumes. And, uh, and then we poke all the hair in individually. And this is all done in the, in the, in the bowling green. And then what we bench build, this is all bench. This, this person that builds these works not from blueprints, just from a sketch on a, on a napkin. And he's just incredible. I mean, he puts it together that way. And then we program it. And so that was, it, it got to a point where I, I, I could only feed the people that worked for me with two pizzas and I decided I need to turn this over to somebody else. And they moved it down to Cincinnati. And so Cincinnati location has basically a number of different kinds of things that go on and of, of part of life formations. Um, they, they do big projects. Um, they do projects all over the world, but they do very, very big projects, entire attractions. Um, this is a 70-foot a tree that they did for Dollywood, um, and it had 1,200 butterflies on there that could do moldable colors. Um, they moved into the digital age, so everything is digital. And so, you know, now instead of having to make a shoe or find a shoe, we just take a picture, put it on there, and then we put it on a machine, and then basically we print it. So this, this is the kind of technology that they're doing down in Cincinnati. Um, the same thing is true. There's the shoe and it's done. Um, now, this is really interesting stuff. That instead of sculpting, we, we pull it in through a digital input. And then what we do is that the, the digital artist works with his stylist. And I'm going to point to it right here. There'll be an arrow. Come on, right there. And then what he can do then is that he has the ability to go in and modify these just by working on clay, but he's not working on clay, he's working on a digital representation of that. And so that's, that's an interesting way of, of having that kind of work get done. We take that and we can do a print of that as well in a 3D printer. Or another way of doing it on large stuff is that we use a robot and the robot cuts it out. This thing is on 24 hours a day. They just turn the lights out at night, and he cuts out these various pieces, and when he gets them cut out, we assemble them and put in there. So these are some of the things that, that we do. We're doing all the fashion stuff as well. We, we now can design our robots and program them right on the screen. We don't have to program them by hand anymore and puppeteer them. As we're building them, we then have the ability to see what the range of motion is and, and, and those kinds of things. And this is, this is basically what that character looks like when it's using. Um, very quickly, I'll go through this. I want to, and this is a, the character when it was done. We, we built this, this animation that went with a roller coaster, and they were afraid that the roller coaster would get too close to the characters. And so we actually had them be able to ride the roller coaster to see where the characters would be so that they were in the safe zone and that they wouldn't get hit. I want to show you something that's online, and I'm allowed to show it because Disney does it. This, this piece that, I'm going to go back here just for a second. Is it going to back up? OK, hold on. Disney is moving into a whole new world and the world is this. This is something they just released a week ago. And what makes it so wonderful is the size of it and its artificial intelligence. What Disney's plan for the future is, is that as you walk through the park, they will have animatronics everywhere. And this, this animatronic learns how to skate in front of you. And he, he's, he even falls and has the ability to get back up again. And what's most amazing to us when we look at it is how much it weighs. Look at this. 
he can lift it up and put it on there. And all of that information is being processed at the same time. So the future of animatronics, I've said this forever, you will have a robot in your life. Robotics is where computers were 30 years ago. And imagine that and where we're at right now. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Huh? Oh, I can stand? OK. Thank you so much, Dr. Poor. Um, fascinating, isn't it? A little bit scary, but fascinating. So at this point, I would like our panelists to please come forward, and I will introduce them. We have Mike Deach from the Toledo Museum of Art. Mike serves as the Amalia Buppas Director of Learning and Interpretation at the Toledo Museum of Art. Uh, he oversees all art classes for adults and children, ranging from drawing, painting, glass blowing, welding, a whole lot of other things. Um, he's also responsible for all the school engagement experiences oh, yeah. and previously yeah. worked at the Brooklyn Museum. We also have Dr. Nate Tice with us. Uh, Dr. Tice serves as Associate Professor of Chemistry and chair of the physical sciences department here at University of Finley. And he, uh, along with Dr. Marie Loudon Haynes, um, has co taught a course on Da Vinci, the art and science uh, intersection, and something else. I don't know. I'm sure you'll probably mention that. And uh, just earlier this week, I know a few of you attended, uh, we were out at the Gillig Winery, and he taught the chemistry of wine. And uh, that was enjoyable for all. So, yes, yes, we, we all learned a great deal. And serving as our moderator is Lori Hauser, who serves as CEO of the Imagination Station in Toledo. Uh, she has been there for 15 years. She has a background in marketing and also operating science centers and uh, a national summer camp program uh, as well. She has been an early leader in, on the interactivity of art and science and has done all kinds of cool things. So I'll turn this over to them and uh, thank, thank you all you. very much for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the nice introduction. And I thought the presentation was wonderful. Um, thank you. Uh, so one thing I'll share with you, um, and it's not a secret, um, is that Imagination Station has a um, whole exhibit, an area on life formations. It's, it's been there for maybe, um, well, over, I guess, almost 15 years now, maybe 12 years. And we came to them with a, a challenge from one of our donors that wanted to do an exhibit on farm to table. And I'm like, how are we going to do that from soil all the way up to it coming to your house? Um, and it was Life Formations that helped come up with a, we have a game show featuring Mother Nature, um, a tractor turned human, and all of the animals and corn, and it is all a game show that you can play. And I will tell you, it scares our cleaning crew at night <laughs> because they are motion activated um, to turn on. And when someone starts talking to you at like 11 o'clock at night, it's not, uh, it can be a little off putting. But uh, then you realize it's Mother Nature. So thank you so much. Um, to start off, I kind of wanted to have a few different conversations. And, and Jean took us down that a little bit of history, but also the future. And the first question is just, what do you see as the future of STEAM? What do you see happening um, in the next 10 years besides the, I mean, you talked about the AI, but even in your own careers, in the lines from an art museum or even at a university, what's that future look like? Gene, yeah. you want to start? Well, you know, I, I don't know if you can even um, begin to think what 10 years from now will look like. Uh, Arrow, a manufacturer of electronic parts does a series of commercials on television. I don't know if they've seen them or not, but they talk about five years out as a maximum that you can even begin to think about. And when I, uh, I just, I, I, I don't get to go down to Cincinnati very much. And I went down in preparation of this presentation. And the things that I saw that the companies that I can't talk about that they're preparing to do 
are so absolutely incredible. Uh, it took my breath. I just was amazed at the technology that's going to be out there. And, um, and you're going to see it, and you're going to live it. And, you know, you, you, look, you look at what we live with now, and we see the, the, the good parts, and we also live the bad parts of all the technologies that are out there. Um, how it's changed education, how it's changed, I mean, it, 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 artificial intelligence is just scary. It's absolutely scary. Um, because we don't, we don't have anybody yet that wants to grab a hold of it and monitor it and manage it. And, and it, it's, it's a loose cannon. And it's, uh, it's, it's great for the entertainment world of, of what that little character can do is amazing, absolutely amazing. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, I loved to just fantasize about what, what could be. And it's, let it go, steamers. It's, it's what you want them there for, to ask the question, where are we gonna be in five years? But I think 10 years is, is not even possible to even begin to get there. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I mean, I, th I can definitely think of in sort of uh, engineering, science, chemistry, physics, things like that. I mean, obviously with the advent of AI, that's going to be huge. Um, I can, uh, you know, for my, in my own field, I'm, I'm very excited for uh, the science that's being developed in space. Um, SpaceX and Blue Origin, uh, that really is going to be the, the next wave that you see of science and, and technology. Um, thinking about, you know, NASA putting a permanent moon base, explorations, things like that, and people kind of go around and say, like, well, why should I care about that? Because that's where innovation is occurring, right? And you're going to have whole industries based upon that, upon uh, space industry, space science, and that will certainly involve robotics and design and things like that. So, and I, I think just in broadly, just piggybacking on what Gene is saying, creativity and innovation is going to be critical. Right, and I think that the days of scientists is basic being, I sit at my lab bench and I, I follow a recipe and then I take my data, that, that's, that's gone, right? The companies need innovators, they need creative folks, so I, I definitely appreciate the, the right brain portion of that, so. Yeah, and I would say, you know, from, from the art side, just building on, you know, what, what has already been said, you know, <clears throat> artists like to hack and modify, and I think they're playing on the tools that are being created and developed by scientists and technologists and engineers. You know, I think about it, I was at Toledo Technology Academy a number of years ago, and you have a group of middle school and high school students who are learning how to create parts through 3D printing, and they understand the software really well, they understand the programming really well, they understand how to make the parts that go to the whole. And then conversely, I'm over at Toledo School for the Arts, and they're 3D printing lightsabers, right? Because they're just playing around with the technology, right? The lightsabers were not to scale. They were not accurate, right? But it was those artists who were sort of pushing those limits mm -hmm. a little bit of what does this technology do? What can I turn it into? And, you know, so I, I see now artists have access to a whole new set of tools that they didn't have access mm -hmm. to before. We're getting ready to open an exhibition at TMA next month. Uh, called Machine Auguries, and it's by this uh, artist, Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. She has gone and recorded bird sounds, working with Black Swamp Conservatory uh, and others in the area, and she is creating machine-generated bird sounds that will now, you will go into this completely immersive installation, and as the light goes up and down within this installation to mimic the, the sunset rising and setting, the bird sounds will change in response to the light. So again, I think it's scientists and, and engineers and, and, and others are providing a whole new skill set, a whole new tool set for artists to be able to play around with and push the limits. So I think to that point, who knows where the next 10 years is gonna take us. You know, if we, we stay on that pathway, what you're talking about, like. I've seen where students have created a violin 
off of a 3D printer with the idea of being able to provide that even to underserved schools mm -hmm. and being able, because that was more affordable to get them introduced to the arts, but it was technology doing that. How, as educators, all three of you are educators, teaching that or making that available, even for somebody who is five, somebody who's 15, somebody who's 25, you know, even at the different levels, how are you teaching that creativity and innovation or encouraging that? I think it's happening even preschool. I watch a one-year-old take up your phone and operate it as <laughs> and play games. A one-year-old. And I, I'm dazzled by that. And I think, I think you know, I, we still have a problem <laughs> with, with the creativity being pushed out of our kids as they grow older. They're put on the planet and they learn everything they become. They learn to walk, talk, ride the bike, interact. All that stuff they do is a part of the process. And as they march forward five, six, and seven years old, little smaller and smaller amount. If, if you ask a five-year-old or a six-year-old, hey, come on up on the stage and sing a song for us right now, everybody, all of them would get, get up right here and start to sing. As they got six, seven, and eight, the hands would start to go down, and, and then they kind of disappear. And I, I would always talk to my kids at, at the university. I would teach a creativity class, and I would say to them, you know, at night when you come in, we usually always teach it in the evening, and I, I can't get you excited about this. And, and I finally kept asking them, what's going on? And they'd say, all day long, we hear facts, how it's done, this is the way it is, all day long. It's just all this content being thrown at us. And then we walk into your room and you tell us there are no rules. You question everything. Why are we doing it that way? You know, and we can't handle that change, that shift. And the other thing that's, there's a thing called the 1840 and 60 law. I don't know if you've ever heard it before. At 18, you worry about what everybody thinks about you. And that is really dangerous, especially in junior high now with the phones and seniors, and it's even into the university of, I don't want to raise my hand because I don't want people to see me. I don't, you know, it, they, they, they're so conscious. And then they get to 40 and they go, I don't really care what people think about me, you know? Yeah. And then they get to be 60 and they realize, Nobody was really thinking about them at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that, that notion of, of working with them, you know, getting them in the first grade, when I used to, I had a presentation called The Last of the Red Hot Learners. And, and it, that, that was them, the kids in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, the last of the, you know, I'm in, I'm in, you know. I, I used to do this with audiences. Every, raise your hand once, everybody, just raise your hand. Now make that noise when you were four and five years old, when you, uh, 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 uh. You, know, you know, doesn't that feel good? I mean, you know, if you want to feel five years old, take a crayon out, you know, and smell it. And if that won't do it, take silly putty out and smell it. That, that olfactory stuff that goes on in your brain will take you right back to when you were five and four and three years old. It's magic. It just is. And I think, you know, and it's beginning to happen because I talk to people who are in education. We're teaching robotics in junior high, but we could be pushing it right down to the first grade. And, and that's, that's when they, they're already, they're already there. Yeah. If, 
If you've got grandchildren, if you've got children, and they're one and two years old, you know they want that phone in their hand. And they, and I had one push my way going, no, you don't know what you're doing. You know, I'll, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the most amazing thing yeah. in the world. And so I think that's where the real movement's gonna come, yeah. well, you know. I, so I, I would also add though, you know, I think creativity is misunderstood. And I think the way that we talk about creativity <laughs> more holistically as a society is misunderstood. You know, I work in an art museum. And so people walk through and they're like, well, this is creativity. Well, that is the output of creativity, but it is also the output of hard work. It is also the output of problem solving. It is also the output of trial and error, right? But all we do is we, we show a painting by Rembrandt. We show a painting by Picasso and say, this is creativity, right? That is part of it. I, that's what I thought was so important uh, about Dr. Poor's presentation, is he showed the process. The process is creativity. Mm -hmm. And that, we don't talk about that enough. The process for us, the way we teach it, this is me sort of generalizing, of course, is like, well, these are steps. These are steps that you have to learn, <laughs> steps that you have to master. No, this is all part of the creative mm -hmm. process. It's trial and error of learning, of making mistakes, mm -hmm. responding to those mistakes. Mm -hmm. But again, from my perspective, sitting up here, working in an art museum, working in the arts, the way we package and present the arts, well, these are created by individuals, these geniuses that don't have to work at anything. But you know, you use the Steve Jobs example. Nobody thinks Steve Jobs made your individual iPhone, right? Of course not, there were a team of people working on this. Artists do the same thing. There are artist workshops that help these individuals work through things. And so this is where I think the way we talk about creativity as a culture, as a society, is really misrepresented. Mm -hmm. It really is the process and to push yourself and to push yourself with others, right? This idea of, of stealing, of collaborating is just, yeah. it, it's grossly misunderstood. For yeah, I, I'd say as an educator though, we have to provide space, right? There has to be the area and the uh, location and the catalyst to do that, right? And so as educators, we certainly you have degree completions and you have to take this and you have to do that. We also have to build in areas where it's like, yeah, it's okay to take on a new project or try something new. I, yeah, definitely, we, we have to make it okay to make mistakes mm -hmm. and be wrong and things like that. So what are we doing as educators and as institutions of higher ed and learning to provide space for innovation? I, I, we have a program called Failure is an Opportunity. Yeah. And we want to encourage kids to fail, actually. I mean, and I heard you, I, I heard the conversation a little bit before. I mean, Thomas Edison, it took a thousand and one ways to fail at a light bulb before he even got there. And each time you're learning a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But today it seems everyone's afraid to make that mistake. You talked about pushing facts on people and, and mm -hmm. remember all of these details, but you don't have that playground to play anymore. How do we get people excited, even they're five, 10, they're excited about STEAM, but then to pursue those careers? Because right now you're teaching people to, for a job that we might not even know that they need mm -hmm. when they are 40, do you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. skill sets. So how are you getting people more excited into going into this pathway? Well, I know we start early here. I'll plug Mazza. Where's Ben? Where's Ben Sapp at? Ben's in here. You know, definitely, we, we definitely start, start that early, get, get that bug in their brain and saying, you can do this, right? The Fun Day Sundays, you know, getting folks in uh, with the art, but also with, with engineering, building Legos and constructing things. So get, get folks early, get their, get their families involved, get their parents involved to say there are career pathways to do that. I think the great thing about the University of Finley is we have a good balance of vocation, but we also have liberal arts, right? It's important. I remember uh, a faculty member whose name will, will remain nameless, you know, a person will remain nameless here, and I'm good friends with him. I remember him standing up at a meeting and saying, well, I train scientists, why do I have to, teach people how to communicate. And I'm like, that's one of the most important things scientists do. That's extremely important to be able to tell people what your research is and what it's about and why does it impact the rest of society. So that's, it's really important for our students also not just to learn, hey, I wanna learn about, you know, about chemistry or physics or biology or mathematics, but also arts and humanities. 
really important. Those skill sets will play a huge role in terms of innovation and creativity and communication with the larger society around you. You know, I, I, I put the hero pictures on, on, the, on the screen and I shared that with you. I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for mentors that I had in life. And, and I don't think enough students take that opportunity to find somebody that's interested in them as mm -hmm. well as they're interested in, in that person. It, it, that's a special relationship. Um, there, there's all these studies out there that say, you know, it, it, two things will help you succeed in life. And one of them is have somebody that takes an interest in you and helps and guides you. And the other one is have them have lots of experience doing a variety of things. When I hear students, and I hear it, when I, I, I would hear it every day, I, I can't find my passion. And I go, well, what have you done? And they haven't done much. And I said, well, you need to do things. You need to, to you know, I said, there's only five things you can do in life. You can sell it, you can manage it, you can design it, you can produce it, and if you can't do those things, you can teach it. And so <laughs> that notion, I said, let's start there, yeah. okay? Which of those five things do you think you might want to do? And, and then, well, I haven't done any of them. Well, that's how you start. Try it. You've got to try stuff. You have to learn who you are first. You know, and, and, and then once you find, and it's inside of you, it's an intrinsic quality, but most people don't want to go through the struggle. You know, when I do this presentation for a long time, I show my first efforts of building robots, and they were terrible. It's a, it's a growing, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it, it was months and years before I got to that stage. But that stage was driven by passion to wanting to do it. You know, I knew that inside of me, when I saw that machine that Disney had created, that, that was a moment in my life that that was a dot. That, that dot was so important to me that I wasn't gonna stop. And I, in between that dot of seeing it and doing it, I did some silly things like build a restaurant. I like to eat in restaurants. I don't like to build, I mean, come on. And own one, that's even worse. And so I learned so much by doing it. And I knew that once I got out of the restaurant business, because I didn't know how to cook, I didn't know how to serve, I didn't know how to wait on tables, I didn't know how to do anything but build. I could build it. I just didn't know how to run it. And I said, my next business I'm going to take is, is that I'm not going to be held hostage by anybody. I know how to do stuff. And so that robot thing was what I went after. So learning about who you are is, is about discovering your passion. And, and so many of the kids haven't paid their dues yet, you know? They're connected to their phone. That doesn't help, you know? You gotta get out of the phone and actually do it. You have to do it. You can't watch it, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I would only add to, to what's been said that, you know, I think, you know, to the analogy of like the, the younger children and, you know, understanding things and, you know, being able to pick up an iPhone and use it right away mm -hmm. at, at one years old. You know, at, at some point in education or in, in, in learning or in development, right, we start to silo things, mm -hmm. right? And I, I don't think that there is as much silo in these disciplines as we present them to be, mm -hmm. right? They all, there, there is a transferable skill set needed for all of them, like problem solving, like critical thinking, right? That I, again, I think, Yes, there are specific, uh, uh, specific contexts and, and domains that are, that are important to understand as you go off in these different divisions, but they're not as different as we make them out to be. And I think in some ways as people get older, right, when they get to 18, we have sort of like hammered that into them, that there is no, that, that there is no difference here. And, and frankly, like in some ways, I don't like the acronym STEAM. 
right? Because to me, that's education, right? I'm glad arts have, have, has been added to STEM, but like with, with the, the focus on STEM for such a long time, we were losing so much of what education and learning was about, right? Now, granted, I am speaking from the perspective of somebody who has been involved with the arts, but there is so much more to learn about life. You know, you reference all of these, you know, individuals like Steve Jobs and Thomas Edison and Leonardo da Vinci, right? They didn't focus in one particular area, right? They studied it all, they learned it all. And so this is where, you know, we, we, we categorize things because it's easier for us, I think, to, to be able to focus and to understand. But this, in some ways, I think these acronyms like STEM or STEAM do a disservice to overall learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have, um, I think, one more question for sake of time and, and honoring everybody's schedules today. But the question is, um, what advice would you give your younger self? So when you're 18, 19 year old selves, what would you, you know, I see some students that are here, um, what would you give yourself? Invest in Apple. <laughs> Apple stock. That's pretty good. Yeah. I know. I, I, I definitely appreciate what Gene says. I said, I think you do have to follow your passion and also don't care as much about what people think of you because they probably don't care, right? Eventually it's like, ah, they probably don't care. And just go for it. Right? I think I've heard that in multiple bits of advice. Yeah, you may not be the best at it, but just say yes. Go for it. Give it a try. Um, I, you know, that's I tell the, the, the chemistry students all the time. Like, you're going to be wrong a lot. I'm wrong all the time. Right? You're going to make mistakes. That's just part of, of the growth process. So I'd say just you know, find your passion and go for it. Failure is a big part of the process. Mm -hmm. You're going to try a lot of stuff, and it's not going to work. And it's, you, you can't let that beat you down. You, you have to continually look and, and, and pull things apart and figure out what I'm about, where am I going, what do I want to do. I, my opening line when I teach entrepreneur classes is, you have a choice. Do you want to work on somebody else's dream or do you want to work on your dream? That's your choice. Which one is it going to be? And then I ask, how many people in this room know somebody who loves what they do? And you know, usually everybody will raise their hand. They know somebody that loves what they do. And I said, now, do you know two people? Do you know three, and four, and then all the hands are down. And I go, do you want to be one of those people that, that basically is just living somebody else's dream, or do you want to work, work on your dream? It's your dream. It's your life. This isn't a rehearsal. This is this is it. This is what you've been given, you know. And I think that that's a, you know, they won the they won the genetic lottery. They were born. Mm -hmm. You've won the genetic lottery. You were born, and uh, you know, Steve said you ought to try to put a dent in the universe, mm -hmm. make things better. I mean, that's what it's about. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have inspired me even today. So I think it's important for all of us to find our heroes too. Mm -hmm. um, even as we're even, even when I'm 50, I'm looking for my heroes. So thank you very much. Um, and I think that we'll all stay around for a little bit if there was any other questions. But I'll turn it back. Thank you. Very, very inspirational. Great. So um, as Lori said, if you have questions, feel free to come up afterward. And uh, I'm sure they'll be hanging around and happy to answer some questions. We also have a wonderful opportunity for you. I know Ben was mentioned and is here. Ben Sapp, yes. And Heather Sensel uh, is also here. And we have the opportunity for anyone who would like to see STEAM in action. You want to see our new Conda STEAM Center. It is just across the sidewalk immediately to the west from here. But um, feel free to stop over, take a look, and uh, we'd, we'd certainly welcome that. A uh, few other things. I want to once again recognize our sponsor, Premier Bank. Thank you so much. I'm sure. A 
our next and final Fridays at Finley of the spring will be April 28th. I know that Dr. Ray McCandless, who is here somewhere, is looking very forward to this. It, Ray is a car guy, and we are going to be talking about the changing landscape of the automobile, things like electric cars, autonomous vehicles, um, different trends with respect to, you know, lots of 20 and 30 somethings are no longer buying a car. They just kind of wait and if they need one for a few days, time to rent and otherwise on the bike or walking they go. Uh, so looking at a number of those uh, different trends that are emerging, so that will be April 28th. Um, I also want to be sure that Doreen Bateson, who is around here, Doreen put the details together for today. So if you've enjoyed the food and camaraderie, et cetera, Doreen, take a bow. Thank you. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you on the table, there are a couple of important cards. There are cards for feedback about today's program. We learn by doing, and we'd welcome your feedback on how you enjoyed today's presentation, other ideas for future programs, anything you think we can do different, better, et cetera, we'd welcome that. There are other important cards on the table, as I had mentioned at the start, Day of Giving. So this is the conclusion of, we call it Dog Day of Giving. So this is the conclusion of our Dog Day. And uh, you may give to any program that you care about here at University of Finley. I think a program such as today gives you a really good sense as to the importance of having a university in your community and what it brings to economic development, what it brings to a diversity of thought and idea generation, et cetera. And, um, we're very fortunate here, so whether it's the arts, whether it's athletics, um, whether it's scholarship, we welcome any and all gifts. So thank you so much for coming. If you're interested in seeing Condesteam, walk just across the sidewalk and it will be open and you can spend a few minutes or as many minutes as you'd like there. And thanks once more to our panel. <laughs>